Good everyone. It is good to see all of you back again this evening. Really excited about uh, my conversation tonight with uh, Sally Gary. As we get started, um, I thought it might be helpful uh, to talk about what we're trying to do tonight. Um, as we have this conversation, uh, I'm really just seeking to get an understanding from, from another person's perspective. And so a few weeks ago, you may remember I did an interview like this uh, with our youth minister, Justin Campbell. And specifically with Justin, we were talking about uh, if we're serious about passing on our faith uh, to others, especially to the next generation, uh, what does it look like for us to try and reach Generation Z? And of course, talking to Justin, who is on that border between uh, millennials and Generation Z and also one who's studied them closely, uh, he made a great conversation partner because it's something that he's uh, very close to. Uh, so tonight, uh, one of the things that several of you had been requesting is uh, just wanting us to, to have some conversation about how do we connect better with members of the LGBTQ community. And so uh, I felt like uh, I should take a similar approach. And so I have a special guest who is with us this evening. And uh, there's a lot of different reasons why you might be interested in uh, getting to know Sally Gary. Uh, currently, she is the director of Centerpiece Ministries. She's going to talk a little bit more later about uh, exactly what all they do with their ministry, but uh, Sally has a background as an educator. I think significantly Sally is a, a lifelong member of Churches of Christ. Uh, she's a, a dedicated Christian. Uh, more recently, she's a cancer survivor, uh, something that I'm uh, happy about and was prayerful about. Uh, but Sally is also a person who experiences same-sex attraction. And so as someone who has deep roots in Churches of Christ and a lot of love for Churches of Christ, but someone who also really understands what it's like to be a member of that community, Sally is using her life uh, for, for ministry to people uh, like herself and uh, has a lot of wisdom for how we can get better at trying to love our neighbors and specifically our neighbors who are members of the LGBTQ uh, community. So uh, as we go tonight, I know some nights I'm able to take a lot of questions and comments. Um, we've got a lot of different stuff to cover tonight. I'll do the best that I can to be uh, paying attention to your questions and comments, uh, but mostly look forward to having uh, Sally share a little bit about herself. So uh, at this time, uh, I am going to get Sally up here on the screen. And Sally, uh, welcome. Really appreciate you being here with us tonight. Hi, Mark. It's good to be with all of you. Well, this is, uh, I've really been looking forward to this. And again, thank you so much uh, for making time for us tonight. Yeah, it's my pleasure. <laughs> well, Sally, um, there's a lot we could talk about with your life story, but uh, why don't you why don't you just walk us through a little bit of what it's like uh, to be you and what your journey has been? That's a that's a nice way to say that I'm old. <laughs> uh, there there definitely is a lot that we could talk about. I'll give you the the Reader's Digest version uh, for for us old timers. We know what Reader's Digest means. Uh -huh. The the abridged version. I grew up uh, going to church all my life. Uh, there's never been a time I didn't know who Jesus was, and I was fortunate to be raised in a family with a mom especially who taught me that God comes first in everything that we do. And so that was just uh, a natural part of life, just as natural as breathing to me was uh, to consider what God wants for us and to learn and memorize and follow scripture uh, that was central to my life growing up. And so uh, I'm the kid who's the leader of the youth group. I'm the kid in your Sunday school class who will answer questions when nobody else will. Um, I went on to Abilene Christian University uh, for my undergrad degree and loved that. You know, I was involved in so many things and had friends and in so many ways, just loved life. Mm -hmm. I, I was a, a kid in a lot of ways. But on the inside, there was always this turmoil that there's something different about me, and I had mm -hmm. no idea what that was. I had no idea how to explain that. But as I've gotten older and I look back, I realize that there were definitely times that um, – they were indicative of my wrestling with my own sexual identity. Mm 
Mm-hmm. And I, I had no words for that. I had no language. And certainly back in the 60s, 70s, and 80s, when I was coming of age, nobody was talking about sexuality except to make fun. Mm. And in my world of the church, which was the guiding force of my life, uh, to talk about your sexuality, especially if it was not heterosexuality, was uh, it was just the absolute worst possible thing that could ever happen. Mm-hmm. Uh, the shame that I felt from that kept me in secrecy for a long, long time. I, I finally realized in college, it was about my junior year, and I finally realized when I found myself falling in love with my best friend, who was mm-hmm. a girl, Um, I had no idea what to do with that. Mm -hmm. Um, I certainly had not asked for this. I did not ask to be attracted to my own sex, but that's where I was. I Mm -hmm. realized my feelings went much deeper than just friendship for her. Mm -hmm. So I began praying. I asked God repeatedly over and over for years to take those feelings away. And while that never did happen, um, I never, I never gave up on God. Mm-hmm. I was always connected uh, to God through graduate school, through teaching high school speech and debate for ten years. Um, after that, ten years with teenagers. Y'all understand this if you've mm-hmm. taught school. I kind of lost my mind and and went to law school after that. But there in law school, I think is is where uh, the Lord really uh, brought me to a place of strength and courage um, through being miserable. I was Mm. absolutely miserable from keeping this secret and finding myself in this cycle of falling in love with a friend that I could never, uh, I I could never act on that. You Mm -hmm. know, the friends that I fell for were were not gay they they were straight and so uh, I just kept uh, entering into something that left me still alone and yeah. I was absolutely miserable hmm. so I finally reached out to someone I didn't know at the time but he was a counselor and I knew that he had done some work in the area of adolescent sexuality in the church and so I, I began working with him and we worked through a lot of things um, with my family, a lot of things with my dad, uh, but we didn't really touch on my sexuality. Uh, mm-hmm. I, I was quite surprised at that, but mm-hmm. the healing that he brought to my family and to my relationship with my father was amazing. Mm. It, was, it was at that point um, that I began to realize that Um, sexuality was something that we had never addressed in Churches of Christ and I didn't want any other kids to grow up not Mm -hmm. having a a safe place and someone who understood because I knew I knew that I was not the only person who had grown up in the church who was gay I had many friends whose stories are, are similar right except that their parents turned away. My parents never turned away from me, and Hmm. I'm so grateful for that. Hmm. But I couldn't stand the thought of any other children growing up and parents believing that they had to walk away from their child. So we started uh, a ministry, a ministry called Centerpiece, and um, I'm excited to tell you more about that later, but that's kind of the journey. Yeah. Um, it's um, it's been difficult simply because when you grow up wrestling with what all this means, what all these feelings mean for you and your life and your sexuality, and yet you don't have any place to talk about that, right? Especially if you have been raised to believe that the church is the the center of your life and where you can bring anything Mm -hmm. but we've known that this is something that you absolutely cannot bring to the table Mm 
uh, for fear or ridicule or or just simple misunderstanding. Right. Um, we've learned so much in the last twenty years. Yeah, Sally, what you're what you're describing, I know. Um, for me, even as I've been thinking about having this conversation with you tonight, um, mm-hmm. I hope I've gotten wiser over the last few years, but just the same. Like you said, it's it's one of those things that um, it's like two areas I, I heard you mentioning. It's like trying to find a space where I know it's okay to articulate, hey, I'm even if it's just confusion, I'm having some confusion mm-hmm. and I'm not sure what right. I'm feeling or what to do with it, having a space to do that. But beyond that, like you say, um, it's like even finding the words to use. Um, mm-hmm. as, as you and I are talking right right now tonight, I'm thinking, and I am mindful about um, how easy it is for our words to be hurtful, even when we might have no idea uh, that that's what we're doing by right. how we talk about people or what we say. Uh, and especially when, as you mentioned, much of what was acceptable to say about this kind of thing was mostly stuff said in jest or for the purpose of being hurtful. And mm-hmm. so, um, yeah, that's that's a challenging spot to be in, Sally. And again, it's it's really kind of you to be willing to kind of open up with us and uh, let us understand a little bit more of what it's been like to be you. Um, thinking about the life of the church and what you've seen, um, what might be some um, common misguided assumptions that we make? You know, when it comes mm. to people who experience same-sex attraction, members of the LGBTQ community. What are some assumptions you see a lot of people make that maybe we should should question a bit? I, I think the the number one misconception that I still see in talking with churches like we're doing tonight is the idea that uh, being attracted to your own sex is a choice. Hmm. It, it's simply not true. Hmm. Uh, that is a myth that has perpetuated this idea that someone who identifies as gay has just fallen off the deep end, they've rebelled against God, they've chosen this lifestyle, we say. Mm -hmm. Um, That's just simply not true. Um, I never chose Mm -hmm. uh, to be attracted to girls. Uh, That was certainly not what I was was raised uh, to think or feel. It was foreign to me. I didn't know anybody who uh, was like that, uh, to my knowledge. Mm-hmm. And so, uh, to say that we chose that is is a it's so hurtful, mm-hmm. uh, as though this were of my own choosing and my fault. Um, another misconception that we have is thinking about well, what has caused this. You know, I was right there when I began this journey. I I thought, okay, okay, God, if I can just figure out what has caused this, I can make it go away. Right. Um, I worked for years, mm-hmm. years, trying to figure out all of the possible causes, and and what I came to discover is that there was absolutely no cookie cutter answer, no across the board uh, experience or characteristic that fit everyone. Right. Um, you know, a, a lot of times people in the church will believe, believe well, someone must have been sexually abused hmm. to be gay. That's not true. I, I was never sexually abused. I know many people who have never been sexually abused who are gay. And by the same token, I know many people who have been sexually abused who are not gay. Yeah. So you see, it just, it boggles the mind when you start trying to to have an A plus B plus C equals D kind of answer. And I think that's where many of us in the church have focused our attention rather than really and truly sitting down and listening and caring for uh, the needs of the LGBT community, we focused on, well, we've got to figure out what causes the so we can make play. Hmm. Right. Um, other misconception or something that I think is really important for us as Christians to realize is how much this conversation has changed. Mm-hmm. Just uh, certainly in the last five years, 
since uh, marriage equality was passed by the Supreme Court. Right. But even before that, I would say uh, this entire century has been uh, a new world to live in. Hmm. And a lot of times we have not kept up with some of the research that's been done that tells us that there's much more to this, Mm -hmm. that there are some physiological components Mm -hmm. uh, that are at play here, such that it's such a complex mix that uh, makes up someone who identifies as LGBT Mm -hmm. that uh, we just can't have a definitive answer. Mm -hmm. Likewise, our language has changed Hmm. and and if you don't take anything else home tonight um i think that would be one of the most important things that we could talk about okay i noticed that you used a phrase that was very important to me okay when i began this journey you said people who experience same-sex attraction Mm -hmm. and when i first began this journey goodness nearly 30 years ago um, I liked that phrase a Mm. lot because prior to learning same-sex attraction the only word I knew was homosexual Mm -hmm. and that was deeply offensive to me Mm. because the word homosexual is used in scripture in the context of being an abomination Mm -hmm. and I'm thinking as a kid but I didn't ask for this I thought God loves me. You tell me all the time, Jesus loves me. I sing the words. Mm -hmm. Are you telling me now that if I have these feelings, this is what I am and this is the word you use to describe me? Yeah. No. Hmm. I had never acted on those feelings. Right. How how could I be an abomination to God? Right. And so that phrase of same-sex attraction was sort of a bridge. Mm Mm-hmm. And it helped me to get past the shame that I felt, hmm. uh, especially from uh, from the church. Yeah. You know, Sally, um, one thing I'm thinking about, talking about language we use, and I, I, it makes me happy that you, you so the, the phrasing that I used in experiencing same-sex attraction, I'm glad, that, uh, I'm glad that that was a phrasing you approved of. I'm thinking about one thing that I've heard said an awful lot over the years where people will related to this topic and some other topics will say things like, uh, hate the sin, love the sinner. And mm. I think what you, what you have just brought up is the fact that, you know, just because you're experiencing an attraction or emotions or whatever it is you're experiencing, as you just said, I hadn't done anything. And I think we see, uh, I think of young people that I know who've struggled with this or that I've talked with. And it's like, like what you said, people are saying, well, I hate, I hate the sin and love the sinner, but I, I think we have to stop and ask, well, well what, what sin if they haven't done anything? Um, exactly. Right. So yeah. I find that phrase to be thoroughly unhelpful uh, in this conversation uh, to, to apply it, that. You know. That's exactly right. Mm-hmm. Um, we, we never seem to really live that out. Right. And, and, um, like you said, there's, there's no sin involved. It is mm-hmm. not a sin for me to experience same sex attraction. And I will add another phrase because sure. if, if you study language at all, we know that language evolves, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, we have changes in our language today, like, uh, three months ago, were we all saying you want to zoom? Mm-hmm. We weren't saying that. Uh, do you want to, uh, why don't you Google it? Mm-hmm. You know, that, uh, that word, that expression wasn't in the dictionary, mm-hmm. but it is now. Um, the same is true for the word gay. Mm. You know, I, I talk to a lot of folks who are just horrified at someone saying I'm a gay Christian. Mm-hmm. And yet when when we get down to talking about, okay, how do you want to reach Generation Z? Mm -hmm. How do you really want to reach the LGBT community? It's uh, it's about learning the language and Mm. learning the language that opens doors rather than closing doors. Right. 
and and when we are insistent on using the language that's language that we've learned and and we're meaning it in a kind way we're we're closing a door hmm. to younger generations because to them um, someone is is gay and that has absolutely nothing to do with their sexual behavior mm -hmm. this is another misconception and that is to identify as gay uh, is all about sexual behavior right and that's all we think of is how someone has sex how they want to have sex that it's all about sexual activity it, it's just not mm -hmm. uh, being gay um, I identify as gay I identify as a gay Christian and what that means to me is simply that I am a woman who is attracted emotionally physically spiritually intellectually sexually to another woman mm -hmm. and so um, that's a big change from what the word gay meant when I was in high school right even when I was in college um, I would say even up until this century and and when I was teaching at ACU back around 2005 2006 I had a, a student uh, come to the group that we had for it was a support group for mm -hmm. uh, students who who identified as gay and and he identified as a gay Christian and I said tell me about that because I knew that this student came from a, a good, faithful home. His father was an elder, and um, he explained to me just what I explained to you. So the language of that earlier generation has changed. Hmm. If you want to have a conversation that's meaningful, we've got to, to be willing to learn that language and know that the meanings have changed, and you're not saying anything bad. Well, mm -hmm. why can't you just say that you're a Christian, Sally? Mm -hmm. Well, I, I do. And uh, I'm a Christian first and foremost. And then I'm Dan and Betty's daughter. I'm Thelma and Andy's granddaughter. You know, those are all parts of my identity. Mm -hmm. But a part that I have not been able to talk about ever, a part of myself that I have never been able to acknowledge that is different and that is so easily misunderstood, especially by my brothers and sisters in Christ, mm -hmm. is the fact that I am gay. Right. It's the fact that my sexuality is different. It doesn't mean in any sense that I uh, have less desire to live as God calls me. Doesn't mean that at all. It means that there is something about me that might make life a little harder especially if I'm not permitted to talk about it. Hmm. Hmm. That's a lot, Sally. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Um, so one of the things you were just talking about is the importance of us getting wiser and how we use our words, uh, language that's helpful and not hurtful. Um, there are several directions you could go with this, but um, in order to learn, I think we have to ask questions. And so what would you say are some healthy questions that the church can be asking? And I think you could go somewhat in the direction of just learning from our, our friends or family who are members mm -hmm. of the LGBTQ community. But mm -hmm. I also think there's some questions we could be asking um, as the church in general. You know, what are, what are the questions scripture would invite us to be thinking about? So Yeah. Yeah. Uh, this is true across the board. Mm -hmm. And that's... Uh, how does God call us to love? Mm. And and if you want to know how God calls us to love, you look no further than the picture of Jesus. You you look at how Jesus lived while he was here on this earth. You follow his example. You know, I think the older I get, um, I thought by this age I would have the answers to all the questions and I would know exactly, you know, what to do in every, no, I learn more from every study those stories of Jesus interacting with people over and over and over to really 
uh, spend time looking at how he related to the woman at the well hmm. and how he related to Zacchaeus and to understand that that these were people that the religious leaders of the day wanted absolutely nothing to do with. Hmm. And yet Jesus pursued them. Hmm. He went after Zacchaeus up in the tree. He asked him to come down and he asked to go to his house. That's a huge deal that we need to spend more time looking at. How does that translate for us today? Who are the Zacchaeuses in our lives? Uh, not just my tax preparer as it <laughs> gets closer to tax time. Um, same thing with the woman at the well. You know, even the, the woman caught in adultery, we want to hone in on that last part of the story where Jesus says, you know, go and sin no more. Mm -hmm. But there's so much that happens before he gets to that. Yeah. And it is humbling uh, how he responds to the religious leaders who were ready to stone her. Right. That gives me pause then in how I, um, how I relate, how I uh, build community with other people. Because ultimately, if we're, if we're about reaching people for Jesus, then we have to treat people like Jesus did. Mm -hmm. And he doesn't, he doesn't turn people away. He invites everybody to the table. Hmm. You know, Sally, uh, one scripture, I, I think it was at Pepperdine, uh, you and uh, my good friend Pat Bills were doing some sessions where y'all were kind of in conversation like we are now. But uh, I think it was you who shared some insight into the, the story of the prodigal son. And something I had never really thought about before is that so often to our own children or family who suddenly you know might might come out and tell us that they they think they're gay or they're experiencing these emotions very often our response to them has actually been the response the prodigal son feared he would get from the father you know if i go home is my dad going to tell me you're not my son don't you ever come back you're worthless you're dead to me go away get out of my life and you challenged with something similar to what you said a few minutes ago i remember you saying the question is what kind of love will bring them home? What kind yeah. of love does it take to bring the prodigals home? And that one has has sat with me a long time. But uh, yeah, um, you know, I I said earlier that I continue to learn. Yeah. The more I look at scripture, and I think we've all been conditioned. You know, we've been conditioned to think of. Uh, homosexuality in general is is a sin so mm -hmm. anyone who calls himself gay that's a, a sinner and so we automatically mm -hmm. put that person into the role of the prodigal right and and yet when I first came out to my parents uh, I was not the prodigal no I was simply revealing something more about myself that they did not know but I was not the prodigal. Mm -hmm. um, I think I think the most important uh, lesson that we can we can derive from this story is that no matter no matter where your child is, mm -hmm. uh, if your child has gone off into debauchery and every kind of of uh, detestable sin we can imagine one of my favorite verses in scripture is is in that story in in Luke where it says but while he was still a long way off hmm. the father went out to meet him hmm. there's absolutely no there's no reason for family to walk away from a child from an adult family member who identifies as LGBTQ. There's no reason because this story, to my knowledge, and Mark, you correct me if I'm wrong, you, you know scripture better mm. than I do, I'm sure, but mm. there's no other example of a father and, and son, a father and child, a parent and child. Uh, that tells us all we need to know. Mm. 
because when the prodigal came back, he didn't he didn't even get to say I'm sorry. Mm-hmm. He didn't he didn't get to repent. We like to think that story is is uh, with a prodigal who had a penitent heart. We right. we don't know that he could have just been hungry, right? And knew that his father would feed him even as a a, a servant. So I think that's something that we need to think about as we begin to welcome people. Yeah. But I think even more now, um, as I think about the LGBTQ people that I encounter, 86% of us um, have been raised in faithful, church-going families. Hmm. Not just Easter and Christmas churchgoers, but three times a week. And so... Uh, to be removed from that environment, to be told you're not welcome at church, to be made to feel that you're not welcome at church, um, it has driven so many of our LGBTQ kids away. It's going to take some profound uh, steps back, not in what we view as moral, not in our convictions as to what's right and wrong, but it's going to take uh, some time to undo the harm that has been done by excluding people mm-hmm. and uh, demonizing people. Not just for our LGBTQ kids, but for our straight kids, those Generation Z kids who say, I've grown up with kids who say they're gay. I've gone to school with them all my life, and I don't understand. And I don't understand how people who say, uh, love your neighbor as yourself, except for, except for this, if someone identifies as this person, that doesn't count. Mm-hmm. Um, that inconsistency has driven our straight kids away more than anything else. Right. I think, um, I think what you said earlier about being willing to open conversations with our LGBTQ loved ones in our families, in our lives, mm-hmm. people that we know, to just simply say, you know, I, I have not understood what this must have been like for you, and I'm not sure that I, that I still do, but I would love to go get a cup of coffee, or why don't you come over for dinner? To our house and and we just love to hear your story hmm. uh, we just love somebody to to tell us what it is that we don't know that we don't know right uh, it's the same kinds of questions that we're having in regard to racial uh, reconciliation right now mm-hmm. and opening those same conversations uh, man I am becoming more and more aware of how much I don't know right right so, um, you know, you've said a little bit about this, but um, maybe you can help us imagine um, when there obviously, as we've been talking about, there's some ways that many times I think churches have probably failed at this. But when church is at her best in trying to love the way that we should, giving people the safe space that they need, creating um, conversations that can lead to, to healing and, and peace. Um, what is that, from what you've seen, what does it look like when it's done well? I think it starts with those conversations. Mm -hmm. Um, And that uh, is most effective uh, one-on-one, you know, family to family. Um, We have a lot of parents in our churches who have never ever been able to share with their church families that they have a child who's gay. Right. You know, my mom and dad were faithful workers uh, all all their lives, and yet uh, it wasn't something that they felt like they could share with everybody. Hmm. Uh, they had, I think, one couple that they could talk to. That's why our parent networks mm-hmm that we offer have powerful 
Uh, mm-hmm. Because people feel very alone, and yet they may be the person teaching a Sunday school class, leading a small group. They may be the person uh, leading worship. They may be the person preaching from the pulpit, and we have not given people a safe place. So um, be willing to talk about that. And Mark, uh, I'll I'll put the onus on you to bring this conversation to the light more in Sunday morning sermons Hmm. in lessons Um, maybe it looks like a series Mm -hmm. uh, that you've gone through but I think the more that we can make this conversation public and and there will be pushback why are we talking about that we Mm -hmm. we all know the Bible's very clear we know what that if I had grown up in a church that was willing to have a six-week series a fall semester study mm-hmm. on sexuality, oh my goodness, if I had heard someone talk kindly about people who identify as gay and how uh, we include everybody in the body of Christ, no matter what, mm. um, that would have been life changing for me. Right. I would have a lot of the energy back that I expended keeping that secret. Mm. I appreciate that uh, charge, Sally. And you know, um, it's not something at, at King's Crossing that we've never talked about. But I will mm-hmm. say, and, I, and I'm totally respecting the confidentiality of. We actually have several people who've talked to me, but every time I have in a sermon tried to open this door a bit to just to get it out on the table and look at it and talk about it uh, without exception every time i've done that i've either had uh, a person come uh, and talk to me and and come out to me privately and let me know mm-hmm. that this is something that they're experiencing mm-hmm. or i've had families who've uh, talked to me about um you know immediate family members and yes. um, and i'm not just talking about one or two uh, we really what yes. you're talking about with the loneliness and the need for connection, um, I don't know that it's that anyone perceives there's any sort of open hostility because I don't I don't think there is right. at our church. But just the same, right. um, boy, this is such a vulnerable conversation uh, to to have with anyone. And again, admire, mm-hmm. I admire your courage so much and your willingness to to let us talk to you about these kinds of things because sure. it is a really difficult conversation to have or even to know how to have. But uh, just the same, I think you're right. I think the more that we open that door, we do send a signal that, hey, we we do actually want to try and love people and to walk with people. And so, uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you for that charge. And uh, so, Sally, what are again, what are some what are some other um, conversation sounds to be like such an important tool that we have of just a Mm -hmm. a non anxious presence and a willingness to listen. So again, um, give us some good, some good questions to bring up. If someone's willing to talk to us and open up to us in this way about this part of themselves, what are some, what are some good kinds of questions to be asking? Very simple questions to me. I, I just like to use the tell me more. Hmm. Tell me more about that. Um, What you asked me at the first, uh, tell me what it's been like to be Sally Mm. um, and and go from there. Um, Once someone does come out to you, you know, it's it's a time to uh, thank the person. Right. uh, For their trust and um, to express how deeply honored you are that uh, they would trust you but from there uh, yeah tell me more tell me what it's been like for you uh, if the person grew up in church tell me what it's been like for you in church tell me what uh, you would like to be different Um, right tell me what uh, tell me what I need to know uh, that I, I don't know. Um, just some of those simple questions. Ask them, ask the person what it's like uh, with their family, if mm. their family has been accepting mm. of them, and uh, if they're on good, good terms with their family, or, or what was it like in school? Mm-hmm. So many kids get, get bullied, um, and this is long before a child ever uh, comes out sometimes, little right. boys especially. 
that's why I say it's so important to make it a public conversation mm -hmm. because it's not just for me, the adult sitting in the audience. It's for it's for the the nine year old kid and the ten year old and the eleven year old who hears that year after year after year after year such that it's a common common topic of conversation, Tom hmm. topic to, to study. Then when I'm fifteen and I'm having feelings that I don't understand, wait a second. I remember that woman that we talked to on a Wednesday night, mm -hmm. I remember mom and dad listening to that and mom and dad were shaking their heads and, and they were receptive and, and, and thinking kindly about her and we had a good conversation. Maybe that's what I feel. Maybe I could tell mom and dad, first of all, but maybe I could talk to my youth minister maybe i could talk to my preacher mm -hmm. maybe i could go to somebody at church that's the way we keep our kids connected to god mm. if church becomes the place that i have to keep everything in and it's not safe and i'm just waiting for the next hammer to drop mm -hmm. saying something ugly tacky about uh and and I, that's not even that's not going to happen in public Right. But it happens so often in conversations out in the foyer. Right. So those are the ways that I think would help. Thank you. Um, you know, Sally, something that you've been hitting on just a little bit, I was thinking about, um, you were talking about questions such as, you know, how, how has your family treated you? You know, what are your experiences been like? Um, in my experience, um, many, many people within the LGBT uh, community, um, as you mentioned, it's not just about sexuality. Uh, for many, it's uh, loneliness is kind of the thing that's yep. that's hard for them. And I, I want to point out um, to, to my to my congregation who's listening, you know, I think if we're going to hold to you know, tr what I would call kind of a traditional understanding of Christian sexual ethics, we have to understand that what we are asking of of gay people is significant. Um, especially if we're thinking in the context of, you know, for example, reaching, reaching someone who is in a committed relationship with another person of their own gender. I mean, if your starting point at talking to that person is to say, well, you need to dissolve this relationship, you know, leave this important part of yourself behind or never talk about it. And um, it seems to me that we've really got to be serious about how we, uh, certainly how we value single people, but We've got to create a kind of, of loving, safe place to land where if we're hoping they'll make that kind of change in their life, they would believe that they could get enough love and support from their Christian brothers and sisters that that would be um, a situation in life they could live with. But um, could, you, could you talk a little bit about loneliness? That, that for me has been a, a recurring theme I've heard a lot about. Yeah, and, and you said it very well, Mark. Um, I was telling you the other day about a, a conversation that I had with uh, a young man who was 14 years old, and uh, he was telling me that he was gay. He had told his parents, and his parents asked me to meet with him, and in the course of our conversation, he shared with me, so Sally, does this mean that I'm going to have to spend the rest of my life by myself? You know, when all we know to say is is no, and you can't do this, and you mustn't do this, and this, well, the Bible's very clear, and that's the only way we respond. You know what Romans 1 says. Hmm. If that's all we know to say to a 14-year-old boy, we've, we've got to sit down and uh, find a better way. Because that 14-year-old boy uh, isn't going to stay. Hmm. Uh, if that's all that God is to us, we have severely limited who God really is. Hmm. And God, uh, God told us it was not good for us to be alone. Right. You know, we want to look to Genesis 1-3 
for a guide uh, for relationships, for sexuality. But somehow, in the course of that, we leave out that very important part that says it is not good for man to be alone. Hmm. Uh, if that's by God's design, then um, that doesn't go away right uh, depending on my sexuality right uh, if i am attracted to my own sex or attracted to the opposite sex it is still not good for me to be alone and we as the church as you said have not done a good job of being with people who are single uh, mm. period but especially in calling people to a life of aloneness and and that is what it is you know we say we use the word celibacy right um, I can't find celibacy in Scripture. If I'm wrong on that, please tell me, Mark. Um, but celibacy is all about sexual behavior. Right. Uh, this is not just about having sex. It's about having someone to share life with. Right. It's about having someone to go out on your deck with at, at night during the summertime and, and uh, plan what you're going to do in the backyard, uh, what kind of flowers you're going to plant in the spring. It's about uh, having someone uh, there when you're sick. It's about having someone to go on vacation with, someone to just curl up on the couch with and watch television. You know, if I went around to everybody who's married in the audience and asked what it is that you would miss most, about your spouse not being there, I doubt very seriously that the sexual part of your relationship would be the first thing you said. Mm. That's not what you value most in that relationship. And the same is true for LGBT people. Yeah. The same is true for me. Right. Um, it's having someone to be with. And so if you are going to require me... Right to live that way in order to be pleasing to God, then I believe we need to pay attention to that part uh, that comes straight from God, that it's not good for Sally to be alone. How are you going to fill that need for me? Right. Uh, a potluck on Sunday nights uh, is wonderful. I love it. I eat way too much, but that's not going to cover what I need. Um, I'm fortunate to have a church that has enveloped me uh, like crazy. Uh, when I was going through chemo with breast cancer, I never went to chemo alone. Um, but I came home alone. And I think that's something that we're going to have to wrestle with. Right. That we're going to have to um, really open our our hearts and minds to the fact that that is what we're calling people to and when you're 14 years old that seems like an eternity yeah it is an eternity yeah um well sally um man th this is this is all so helpful um i want to make sure we have a little bit of time and i think that the 14 year old boy probably mm -hmm. makes a good segue uh, to give you a chance to talk a little bit about centerpiece and your ministry and what it is you're trying to do through your ministry. So uh, if you don't mind, uh, we've got a few minutes left for class. Why don't you talk some about uh, this ministry that you've had going for several years and um, how you're trying to help? Sure. We are about to celebrate. Mark, can you believe that we're about to be 14 years old? Wow. Later, later this month, uh, we will celebrate our 14th birthday as a, a nonprofit in the state okay. of Texas. Okay. So I'm really excited about that. Um, we have been doing uh, what we call tapestry retreats mm -hmm. that are for LGBTQ people. Uh, it's a spiritual formation retreat that says, okay, uh, this is a part of me. This is who I am. Uh, but what do I do with that as a Christian, as mm -hmm. a Christ follower? How do I live faithfully uh, with God? And, and we've been doing those for 10 years. Uh, been a tremendous encouragement uh, to me and to those who have attended. We also do parent retreats, like I mentioned earlier, called Peace Prints. Mm -hmm. We do those in Nashville, and we do those in Texas as well. So... Mm -hmm. 
Um, and they can learn about all these on your uh, centerpiece.net, I believe. That's the website. Yes. I've got that up on the screen. And uh, yes. yeah, keep, keep talking. Keep talking. I just want to make sure they know the link. Mm -hmm. Centerpiece.net, uh, all of it is up there. We've actually, since uh, the pandemic, we have been doing some online mm -hmm. retreats, and we're about to announce a parent retreat that will be online in August. So Great. I would encourage you to go there or go to our Facebook page that is Centerpiece Inc. And remember that it's spelled P E A C E I N C. Mm -hmm. um, in addition to that, the biggest thing that we do is uh, the E3 conference to equip, empower, and encourage uh, church leaders, LGBT people, our parents, our family members, and allies. It is a wonderful conference. We'll be doing our fifth conference um, in Dallas, October 22nd through the 24th at the Highland Oaks Church of Christ. We have a fantastic lineup of speakers. We will have uh, people on the, the younger end of the spectrum like Justin Lee and Matthew Vines. We will also have professors from Abilene Christian, the Dean of the College of Biblical Studies from Oklahoma Christian, Charles Ricks. We'll have people uh, from all over the country who are doing presentations and uh, talking about how, how do we live this out? Uh, how do we respond in a more Christ-like way? How do we incorporate the LGBT community into our churches? Uh, what does that mean for our convictions? Uh, we're gonna be talking about all of that uh, for three days. Uh, the past conferences that we've had have been like a big family reunion. Mm. So uh, I would encourage any of you who have a heart for this type of ministry or have need, please join us. Uh, if it's not for you and you want to help somebody else go, there are ways that you can do that as well. So just check out our website and uh, see how you can help. Great. Sally, this is uh, this has been so good. Uh, I knew it would be, but again, I continue to appreciate you and your your kind spirit and uh, your willingness to be patient uh, with people. Uh, I know it's not always easy to have these conversations. In fact, I don't think it's ever easy uh, to have these conversations, but uh, you, you do so much in, in helping us. Uh, if you don't mind, I usually close out my class with a prayer. Would I? Can I please have a prayer with you for your ministry? I would love that. Okay, Mark. we're, we're going to close out. Great. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. God, I'm so grateful for all the ways that you bless us. Uh, we're thankful especially for the love of Christ, which uh, transcends all boundaries that we would create, uh, that, that reaches hearts, that reaches lives. And uh, I do pray especially for Sally. I pray for Centerpiece. I pray for all the people that she's been able to touch uh, through her experiences, her testimony, and certainly her love uh, for you. I pray that you continue to work through her and uh, the efforts that she's making. I also pray that you'd be with our congregation, uh, that we really do desire to be a congregation that, that lifts up Jesus, uh, that loves you with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength, but that we also uh, love our neighbors uh, as we would love ourselves, and that certainly in includes our LGBTQ neighbors. Uh, so, Lord, give us strength and give us wisdom, and thank you again uh, that we've had this opportunity tonight to share in each other's lives. I pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, Sally, thank you so much. and uh, Thank you, Mark. I appreciate this time. All right. We'll look forward to uh, staying in touch with you. All right, everybody, okay. I'm closing out for Bye -bye. the evening. Bye-bye. In the 13 years I've been in ministry, I've worked with, uh, with college students, I've worked with high school students, and I've worked with adults. And working with, working with high school students, watching, watching them deal with the questions and watching them have to wonder about the weighty issues of if they express their sexuality, if they express the questions that they're dealing with, where are they going to have a safe place? Where are they going to be able to find someone who will sit and listen and hear and show compassion. It, it draws me in to want to be one of those places, to be one of the voices, to be one of the people who will, who will sit and listen. And for that, I have to learn. I, I have to learn the language. I have to learn 
how to offer myself in that situation where I don't come across as one of those old guys who just wags my finger and tells them you know better.